get it out, put it on the uh, the B roll at the end. B roll, as if yeah. I do B roll. The B roll. It's always at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, it's the best bit. It's the best bit. Of the um, I turn it off after five minutes. You're like, no, who's this? Oh, yes. oh it's not me. <laughs> yeah, it's not me. Hello and welcome to the Diaz Book Club, a weekly book club podcast where we talk about some Dungeons Dragons and discuss how we might include them in our role-playing campaigns. With me, back again after a small hiatus, is my wonderful friend, Rob. Rob, hello. hello. It has been a while, hasn't it? I was trying to remember what the last one was. It Al-Kadim? Was it I was going to say, it was Al-Kadim last time. We went from, we'll go from one big desert to another big desert. <laughs> Yeah, I only bring you out of retirement to talk about older settings, it seems. <laughs> yes, and sand. And sand. I love, I hate the feel of sand. I guess, like, I don't mind it until you're in the car afterwards or, or wherever and you have to wash it off with water. Those are those are my seaside memories from when I was little. Going, I mean, that, mine was a Star Wars reference, but it's fine. It's fine. Oh, there I you go. Some terrible dialogue <laughs> for episode two. Yeah, that's how, where we diverge in that's our baby. Yeah, you, the go, you go outside. Uh, you know, like, sometimes, sometimes, not often. But yes, yeah, so you sort of referenced it a little bit. What are we talking about today, Rob? What is our topic of choice? Uh, the classic, classic campaign setting Dark Sun, beloved by grognards or grognards of all stripes. Wonderful second edition dark fantasy setting for D&D. Just um, one of the classic. I, I, I'm going to assume most people have heard of Dark Sun, even if they're not 100% aware of it. I always feel that any discussion on D D online at some point someone will chip in with a yes but what about dark sun <laughs> um in terms of like they'll release a book dragon Island, and then five comments down yes but what about dark sun yeah, so... yeah it always sort of comes up when you see uh well releasing uh the new spell jam or dragon Island, and yeah it always is one of the tough ones and i'll be honest i think it was thanks to you talking to you about it mm. uh from previous like alcadim and stuff that you had mentioned dark sun because i again i'm one of those people who you know, a fifth edition baby, and I'm just like finding out all about these things and stuff. So yeah, coming into Dark Sun, yeah, instantly I was like, ooh, I love the aesthetic, I love the ideas behind it. But also, when I was reading deeper into this episode, I was like, I can understand why it's not come back so much yes. yet. It, it would be one of the settings I think that would require the most work on Wizards of the Coast's um, perspective. It's easy to dang once. It's quite easy to put that back in. People still like dragons and lances. Um, Dark Sun <laughs> covers an enormous amount of problematic elements by its mm. very nature, which I don't think is to say yeah. it's stuff that should be ignored or removed from the setting, and no. we'll talk about that later. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it is a setting where you need buy-in from the table. A hundred percent. If you went to a convention table, I'm, I'm running D&D, and you drop Dark Sun, I think people would be a bit like, whoa, well, where's my broadsword of plus one and mm -hmm. my um, fucking tiefling? you know, with a hilarious voice actor voice or something. <laughs> I think it's interesting, though, because obviously from uh, previous episodes I've done with you, so obviously oh. uh, Al-Kadim, and also that Session Zero Treasure Hunt or Treasure Island. Treasure, yeah, yeah, Treasure yeah. Island. Learn about that. One of the big elements that sort of comes up in those two particular things is, and I'll just say it now for the podcast recording, is slavery. Also, I so agree. I just wondered if that is just a big part of older d d is that there is, like, you are slaves or you have a... So there's you know there's slaves around etc and it just it just I think there's this obsession with it which obviously is quite big in Dark Souls setting as a result well, it just it just struck me as like God what you couldn't just be a free person no matter who you are <laughs> no the, the, there's definite trends and I think the trend for particularly in games written in the 80s and I was saying to the early 90s exemplified by something like Warhammer is the aesthetic of the pathetic which is you start low, you start low, low, low. And Gygax mentioned that, Gygax said he always found it more interesting when you earned it. And I think this is the big divide, and we'll do this very, very quickly, the big divide between 5e players and older players, and I'm bunny earing that as a podcast, yep. is 5e, you are heroes. You yep. are low-level heroes, but you're heroes. Whereas in old D&D, you're adventurers. Mm. And there's a good chance your adventure will end when a rock drops on your head. In 5e, a rock drops on your head, probably does wall a d10 damage, which probably isn't enough to take you down. Even if it does take you down, you've got three death saves to make. And then even if that happens, you can get dragged to town and resurrected. Mm -hmm. You're a more permanent part of the universe. You are a Boromir. 
or uh, mm. not an Aragorn, but you're a Boromir, a Gimli, a Legolas. In old D&D, you're a man of Gondor. Yeah. Or uh, you, maybe you're a ranger if you get to level two or three, but you are just a man of Rohan, a man of Gondor. Here's your spear. Here's your big shield. Mm-hmm. Go. And what's the lowest thing in society you can be? A slave. So if you want to be absolutely at the bottom, and with a death like Dark Sun that really wants to exemplify that, and if it will treasure hunt being level zero as opposed to level one, you're really starting at the bottom. Also, and I'm going to just quickly switch across mm-hmm. to a more historicity side, the term slave is often bandied about in a way that what we now call indentured servitude. <laughs> you would be a slave, but into different terms. And I think a lot of the old medieval style D&D modules, what you're actually are is an indentured servant. Yes. Well, what they've used the term, or indentured server, what they've used the term is, is slave. Yes, I agree. The, the, the reason, I just think, I, I think there's huge trends in this. And to drop one here for discussion later, well, not later in this podcast, but later, maybe your community would like to discuss it. Mm. The big trend of vampire uh, style gaming and fiction, things like Interview with the Vampire, uh, The X Files having a vampire episode, Vampire the Masquerade being the role play example, at a point when the AIDS epidemic is sweeping the country and the world and the transfer of blood becomes a taboo thing again. These things do pay in and I do wonder if these trends are really interesting to watch. Mm. And I think, yes, you're right. I think that's a good highlight of in the 18th, there was this sort of the the slavery element became big in RPGs. But there you go. Yes, agreed. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't considered, like, yeah, like you said, that sort of parallel with uh, vampires as a concept anyway. Like, obviously, Curse of Strahd, big old Strahd, bloody everywhere, right? Uh, Yeah. The other thing, like think about thing again in the pandemic we've had recently. You know that old pandemic that didn't affect yeah. anyone. That's fine. It's over. We won. We've we've won. We'll quick play the Dan Busters theme. Show some spit fire. <laughs> what with Boris Johnson on them? I don't think no, so. He's out. He's out. He's out, he's out, he's out. That's how we date this episode. <laughs> yeah. No Queen. No Boris. So it is the Dark Sun timeline. Um, but uh, Best son. when the when the pandemic happened. Uh, I remember D&D Beyond promoted, like, oh, well, obviously get everyone into D&D because we're all online now. So they had free stuff to give out. Oh. And they did one called The Frozen Sick, which is a critical role uh, adventure. Oh. And it was about an epidemic. Oh, no. And I was just there going, like, I get it. Like, you want to give out free stuff yeah. or something, but anything, anything else. One. Pick another one. Anything, guys. But yes, because so yes, obviously sickness as well, that, you know, goes through a whole communities and stuff. So people, yeah. again, DMs and, and people, storytellers in general, pick from reality as well. But... Uh, yeah, just I just thought it was so interesting that the last couple of times, which I'm not oh. saying it's a reflection on you, no, uh, no, Rob, no, no. but it's just no, it was just absolutely. interesting. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I, I hadn't clicked it actually. Yeah, but then there was also this is a whole discussion about D and D being a society that doesn't work. Um, mm. We'll uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll that's not for this. We're talking about Dark Sun. We're already veered into yeah. IV and stuff. So let let's let's move yeah. on to the actual setting. So if you were going to give a quick summary, Rob, of what Dark Sun is for the newly initiated into D&D, what would you say? I would say that Dark Sun is a post-apocalyptic fantasy. You are playing in uh, a world, a desert world, where basically things are awful. Um, <laughs> it's an environmental catastrophe. There are great death spots that rule who are, who are wizards. And most people scratch out a living either in the deserts of the world or the rough land, the bad lands, or in sort of awful, imagine ancient Egyptian slash Sumerian slash Babylonian cities, which are just terrible places, really. It's a world where the, the weak are just killed, are just you know, stamped down upon. Mm. It's very uh, Darwinian. It's very, it definitely feeds into a power fantasy. Mm-hmm. It's very homoerotic. Uh, <laughs> look at the art. It is a lot of oiled up gladiators, uh, Brom art, which is stunning, and I love it, and definitely shaped my fantasy viewing and and uh, enjoyment. But it's very of one style, mm-hmm. very sword and sorcery. It's a post-apocalyptic fantasy sword and sorcery, swords and sandals. Sorry, it's what I meant to say. Setting. <laughs> I was just going to say on that artwork, the prom artwork. That's what? the only time that one artist has been used. So, so we're looking at the the first box set for Dawson. Yes. And Brom's art is the only art that's been used throughout, which is like a first for me. And yeah, it, as you said, it's very obviously pencil line drawings, etc. But it's incredible. Like everyone is very muscular, and everyone is very like muscle poses yeah. and all that sort of thing. You're like. 
yeah <laughs> yeah it's very cool i'd never seen anything like that compared to previous ones where we looked at which is a bit more again obviously different artists and stuff but it's just i was yeah. like oh very striking like you know it's a dark yeah. and setting because it's using brom art and i love that I thought that's great. I I am a big fan of one person's creative vision. Well, we did cover this in Tolus, where it's one person's creative vision. I love that. I thought that's great because if you don't like it, you don't like it. That's fine. But if you do, you're like, wow, yeah. It, it's like if, if Mobius did an RPG module, and you'd be like, yes, I want to do this. Um, <laughs> and this this clicks with me. I love Roman stuff. I love. I, I do for, for what we were saying before. I love Sand. I realize this is my favorite films are Star Wars and you know Dune and Fury Road. I was so gonna say, yeah. yeah, just just love, just love sand. It's just great. Yeah, I feel like for me, my entry road in was Mad Max Fury Road, and now yeah. obviously June. That idea of it is compared to uh, to Alcadim. I was gonna say a Karen Sangar, mm. which is actually a different module. <laughs> I'll talk to you about in a second. It's hot, unpleasantly hot, burning, and it's there's very little water. There's uh, there's yeah. rules about what you do for dehydration, and you know when it's like I've played Alien RPG, and there's rules Probably. about bloody everything, and I was like. Oh, does it make sense? And it does, depending on the situation. Here, water is so important. It was, yeah. There was some quote I read which was talking about, imagine a world where, uh, this this world of darks and uh, Athos, that maybe there was a different time where Athos was a place of beautifulness yeah. and, and I mean, where honour was as precious as the water here. But that is not this place. It's a very June in terms of that with the water. I think, I was just thinking then, if you want to, a quick intro to darks so on watch the five minutes in the Conan film where he's strapped to a tree and left to die in the sun and that gives you everything you need to know about Dark Sun <laughs> this big bronzed guy just dying slowly of dehydration that's exactly what Dark Sun is there's other things that have sort of come up for me that there's no particular deities in this one no. the religion is sort of like non-existent compared to Akarin Sangar I uh, know, uh, compared to Alkadim, sorry. Mm -hmm. And that, as you sort of said, people get their magic from either the uh, world around them or through these sorcerer kings, which I, I love the concept of these uh, right. Templars, you know, being this sort of holy order, which is evil uh, yeah. to an extent or corrupt and maybe not evil yeah. per se. But also this idea, and I haven't come across, across this sort of thing before, that arcane magic, you could sort of be sort of split down into sort of preservers that preserves and gives back what you take from around you or to fire those who just destroys everything. Yeah. He was very um, full metal alchemist, that sort of transference stuff, but also just like, I'm just going to take it from my own. And it's, yeah. I just love that concept of you just taking stuff and it just yeah. destroys the environment. But there's a big theme here about almost like climate change in a oh, way. Huge. It's all about environmental disaster, really. And, and, and caused by these sorcerer kings who, you know, could be a good parallel for, for industries that just pollute mm. and take. You know, if you're a defiling sorcerer king, all you're going to be doing, the lands around you are just going to be sucked to life and stuff. The idea of wizards as tyrants, I love because magic would be terrifying. And yeah. the idea of even good magic would be terrifying. If you're the one person in town that can bring relatives back from the dead, you're going to have some power in that community, right? Because mm -hmm. you'll be like, well, I don't have to bring your dad back, or I could bring your dad back. And <laughs> I just think it's such a brilliant... It, it's a setting that I think makes D&D make sense because D&D doesn't make sense. I've already touched on this. Mm -hmm. If you have cure light wounds, what does warfare look like? This is weird. Why am I going to war getting stabbed? And then mm. just go home and get cured like wounds. This is pointless. Anyway, that's the whole thing. In here, magic is so base and corrupted, but also the, one of the only sources of power and hope. It kind of shows you what a society... If humans were given magic, I think we'd more likely end up in Dark Sun than we would Greyhawk. Mm -hmm. You know, we would just be terrible. Yes, obviously, yeah. Absolutely dreadful. I mean... Your source is the world right now, right? You look out the window and you go, yeah, we're we're in the dark sun setting at yeah. this point. Yeah, the way we gain power is by consuming, and that instead of magic, it's coal or whatever. But yes, mm. we would, dark sun, I think, is the most realistic ending for humanity in terms of D&D. But uh, looking at the other sort of magic, so you've got what? sort of Templars, which take their source from these uh, sorcerer kings, these sort of wizards and stuff, but you also have like clerics they get their magic from the four elements uh, which is slightly different to obviously because there's no deity so they get it from elsewhere but then druids i thought were quite interesting i don't know if you saw this this idea that they get it from a geographical location mm. so like rocks or so spirits yeah. there associated with that and i just thought that's really you could be really customizable about what your magic is as a result like obviously the overall flavor you could change it to whatever but i just thought i'd never considered that because obviously druids in 
current D&D setting is obviously nature-based anyway. Mm. But yeah, looking at Dark Side, it's like, well, there's not much in terms of variation in nature compared to like say if you were going to be uh, a druid you could be of like the mountains or the ice or whatever but here it's like no think of a geographical location maybe t- palm trees or an oasis yeah. or something a particular oasis so i thought that was quite cool and a little bit different that's great I-, I love that idea druid of the badlands or druid of the you know it's- i really like druids are an interesting one because i find they it's very weird that you have druids who have knowledge of every single animal that's ever existed uh, you know, and they always know the right one to turn into it by putting like, have you heard of a platypus? You know, like, because I think when you start thinking about stuff like that, you have to start thinking about the flora and fauna of where you play. Yeah. Like, would a druid of salt marsh have heard of an elephant? And then you're getting into very complicated <laughs> uh, things. It was, I think this world is so limited, you know. You're not going to go well. It'll be a hippopotamus. You're like, no, you're not. Mm. You, there's no water. Why would hippos be here? You mm. know. Whereas actually, you're a druid of, as you say, an oasis or the badlands that limits you in a good way. It means you'll you can be more creative with it. You know. Well, speaking of animals as well, they've changed well, it slightly because again, when you think of uh, Alcadim, obviously, again, that's what the more desert setting where you've got camels and, and horses. Like I say, like uh, real world examples of this here, in Dark Sun, they've gone. What about dinos? What about lizards? You know, and those yeah. are the beasts of burden and stuff. So again, there's some cracking Brom artwork of these ridiculous looking like lizard stuff, which again really adds to that terrifying like, oh my yeah. god, what if this? Uh, but because exactly as you said, that water is such a big thing. You need creatures that can contain water whilst they're traveling these long distances between villages, between city states, and all that sort of thing. And I just yeah. again that makes it one step further. Like, oh, this is such a different yeah. to your grim dark setting set in the desert it's like yeah it's almost like an alien planet in a way you know yeah it's very it has those touches of science fiction it's very numenera like it's mm-hmm. very vaults of Varn, if you play that which is an osr game but um ultraviolet grasslands yes it's very you can imagine finding a laser gun in a ruin in here and it would only have a few charges but there's very much a feel of the alien it's for me it touches on a lot of well i mean really the i would say the biggest influence on it i think would be jack vance's dying earth so mm-hmm. i think it's very much and if you're into D, good god go read some jack vance because if you the term fancy and magic is the you know the name of the spell you cast the spell you lose that spell until you rememorize it that's so good uses fancy and magic and jack this is jack vance's dying earth it's a world where people don't know what's going on there's Beating sums, it's terrible, but there's also all these relics, and there's also this whole society that grew up around it. I think a good segue there is how then player races are different here. Yes. You have some excellent new races to play with. You have my favourite, the Mull. Yeah. Who, as far as I'm aware, have not appeared in fifth edition. Not, not think... I'm aware either, and I don't. And I don't really know why. And I wonder if it's maybe I want as well. Yeah, I wonder if they're just they're just a bit like I don't know. There's this whole thing of uh, you know mixed ancestry that's come out recently about uh, how do you define it, and they they've kind yeah, of sure. it was a bit bleh in that sort of sense. But I thought like it makes sense. Like you would yeah. have you got half elves, you got half orcs, mulls are half dwarves, and yeah, absolutely brilliant. Oh, oh, I'd love that character class. What a great character class! You know, you just double hard. You just just absolutely hard. Like <laughs> basically, it's great. Um, and as you can see in the theme, there's half giants. Yes, which I imagine is now sort of the Goliath. Right, I, I assume think, so. I think yeah. Goliath has sort of taken that rather than say half giant but yeah so effectively you could pack that across and they're the absolute best the free cream which oh, i think as yeah. i say is how i'm always say it and it's not real so you can't actually tell me <laughs> uh, which are giant bugs brilliant get to play giant bug yeah they've been brought back in uh this uh spell uh spell jammer and i thought they were spell um, jammer that... originally but i believe they are that's on the other yeah, the yeah oh. these incredible you, again, uh, the artwork of them is really vicious in the Brom artwork of them, and then they've brought, been brought back, and they've always all these different iridescent colours and stuff, and just, I don't know, they're very, I would recommend checking them out from the Spelljammer stuff, just a little bit different, and they're not as, I guess, vicious as maybe the Dark Sun setting has put them out to be, but they're so different and alien. This is the thing, I say, I'm always a big fan of playing races that aren't necessarily, that, that just think differently, they're not just like, 
oh, you're a human with horns. Oh, you are this but with a tail. Like I, I, I want something so different. Yeah. Like um, they've also brought out like plasmoids, which I think were in Spelljam as well. This idea of like a literally an ooze type person. Uh, again, really interesting. I just think something different. Yeah. One thing I'd like to say actually, because it came in the rules supplement, I think they were called character trees or something like that, and it said like, okay, we're gonna level with you. This is this is hard work. This this is uh, <laughs> you know, your characters are probably gonna die. That's yeah. always suggest you start at level three. <laughs> it always makes me laugh. Yeah, start level three, which in A D and D is big. A D a level three A D and D character is probably actually a starting five E character, but believe me, that was big. That was that was yeah. not getting crushed by a rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you managed to uh, dodge out of the way or said rock yeah. before getting crushed by a different rock. Yeah, the second rock gets. But it talks about like, okay, you create your active character, but also create three characters in reserve, uh, and they are inactive, and you can switch between them at, at three certain points whereby Oh, you've got downtime, you switch to the other person. Your character dies, you switch to the other person. Or you can switch them if you're on a quest currently. But it's up to the GM to agree. Also, it will take 3, 3d6 days for them to get there. Which is just I yeah. love. And it's like, oh, they're, they'll be here in like a week's time <laughs> as you are desperately yeah. trying to get to the uh, end of stuff. I think it's great. I mean, they've just kind of coined it as Magicka as troop play. And I am a huge fan of it. I mean, it's a great idea. Right. Setting that it's because... I think there are times you can go, we don't need to wait the D3 days. It's fine. Um, so we'll talk about this with the star adventure in it. Yeah. There's a good chance your character will die. And part of the setup of the star adventure is you're isolated in the middle of the desert. It would kind of suck if you're like, okay, you just sit in the corner now. We're going to keep playing for a bit. And then your guy will turn over there. You just go, we're part of a big group traveling through the desert. And the next person steps up kind of thing. But anyway, uh, I think particularly in a setting like this, where you're trying to get over the deadliness, mm -hmm. true play immediately enters that because you know if you die, as a player, you're not dead, you're back in the game. But that, that character is very vulnerable because there is a backup. And it's always worrying when there's a backup because you know there's a vulnerability <laughs> there. You know what I mean? It's not you'll yeah, yeah. have to sit and roll up another one and come up with a backstory and everything. It's just no, it doesn't matter. You, they will die. It's, it's the it's the um funnel system all over again where you yes. have a number of people, so it's fine. Yeah, from uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics or Crash Classic Dungeon Crawl yes. or however you pronounce it. Crawl Classics, DCC. DCC. Um, yeah. But one thing I did find interesting, one of these sort of, rec well, it, it's a requisite, basically, of like, every one of your characters has to be the same alignment. Ooh. So good, evil, chaotic, whatever. The reason I sort of mention this is because it talks about those half giants, that they have to change their morality, or it's a, they change their morality every day. Yeah. And like, what do you do with that? And I thought that was interesting, that idea of this almost like chaotic thing, is that you change your perspective every day. Again, for me as a player, I would just be like, this sounds like it could get dangerous very quickly, certainly yeah. in a, a hot desert area where I could be like, well, screw all you people, etc. But it, it did have a really interesting, um, again, I can't remember which supplement it was in, but talked about like, well, how do you play a certain character's sort of outlook well, when it, you know, like, how do you do it? And it gave the example of what you do when you take water, because obviously yeah, water is such an important thing. And it goes, if you are lawful good, you're going to give water away to other people. Yeah. That's why you might die, etc. Or yeah. evil, you take more than your share, like all that sort of thing. I just thought that was a really nice way of just, here's an example of all the different ways you could take on it and, and use that example to extrapolate, you know, like take that point of view elsewhere. Yeah. And I just, because sometimes it's very hard, because for me, obviously, I'm like, well, evil's probably selfish. And that's as far as I go. Yeah, but it just—I thought it was such a good breakdown of like if you want to play that way, that's how, how you role play or how you make decisions. It was just a good way to, to do something about a resource that is so precious to the system. Mm. Do people still play with alignments? Um, I think it, it's less important now. They certainly are getting rid of it in a sense of like. So if you look at the uh, current uh, fifth edition handbook and obviously soon to be universal D and D zero or D and D, or D, &D, or D, &D next or D and D yeah. the future D and D two. Yeah. Boogaloo. Um, it is. They are stripping away alignment in general because they don't like certain races being constantly evil. Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, which totally makes sense. Actually, so I don't know. I think it will probably be removed in general. Yeah. I always find like for me, like I do need a little bit of prompt because otherwise my characters do turn out to just be me making <laughs> a decision on how I feel. And I yeah. always, I'm. I mean, I don't know about yourself, Rob, but when I'm playing video games. I always feel incredibly guilty if I make a, if I make awesome. a bad decision, you know. Yeah. So I'm like, I do, you know, if I want to play a certain campaign, I would, I personally, I don't mind having a couple of pointers just to help me right. get to that thing. But I understand that that's not everyone's cup of tea, per mm -hmm. se. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the box in general. So it's actually, I've, I've actually never come across a box like this. So obviously, you get like the rule book and you get the uh -huh. Wanderers Journal, which is like a primer and stuff. But then you have three other little, well, four other little bits. Where it is, as you said, there's like a, a little book, a little bit of fiction called A Little Knowledge, yes. which is like 
uh, like almost like an introduction to what Dark Sun is with characters, etc. And it sort of finishes and then it goes, right, so that adventure, your characters might have been a part of it, but you're not mm-hmm. the main characters. This is mm-hmm. happening separately to you. And I love that. It's great, isn't it? You're straight in. You're straight in. You're bought in immediately, right? Yeah, because it's, it's that idea of somebody getting taken in, it becomes yeah. a slave, and then works out. Well, one thing we haven't talked about, which I know we will do, it sort of becomes a psionic. Uh, and then breaks free and then they find something and then they go off on their own little adventure and it's like you guys are the other people in the the slave hold essentially and then here is your adventure which is the dms but which is only 25 pages this sort of little separate adventure which then comes with player aid cards so you can you can see the image of where you are and then you read out your little bit again all of it is like here is one page of an encounter here's the next page of the encounter and what to do if they've they've missed it or they go back you can just go between these cards and i just like I can imagine, as a tactile person, putting those cards down, yeah. very easy to end up going back and forth between a huge volume. Absolutely. I, I, so, background for me, I picked up Dark Sun when I was about 12, 11, 12 years old. Mm-hmm. My first impression was getting it, saving up my money, buying it, opening it, learning that I'd have to have the sign its handbook to play with it, which <laughs> was rushing the cards. It was not easy to get hold of D&D supplements in yeah. 1990s Manchester, so I had to order that through a shop. And it's not like nowadays where you just order, it was literally they had to write to America and get one sent to them. It was not easy stuff, so I didn't actually get to play it for a long time. But a book was terrifying. Books are mm. terrifying. <laughs> Flipping back and forth is terrifying. So we should say these. this adventure comes in flip chart format, yeah. which... As a professional administrator at the university, is just wonderful. Put everything on a flip chart. Um, <laughs> you have one for the DM, one for the players. And as you say, the DM one has encounter after encounter, one page, self contained, adversary stats on that page. Yep. What to do. And as you say at the bottom, almost a choose your adventure fighting fantasy if the players do this and if the players do this. And having run that adventure, oh. I can tell you that actually. While you're like, yes, but what if they do why? They don't. Actually, you are limited to choices. It's a very good intro adventure because mm-hmm. you're put in a situation where you're in a, you are slaves in a caravan which is attacked and then you're cast out into the desert. Get on with it. And yep. you, you don't have a lot of choice in that, but it immediately hammers home what Dark Sun is. Mm-hmm. Um, it has flaws. Mm-hmm. It's very hard. It's yes. very, very difficult as an adventure. And it's very dick kick city you start and someone keeps you dick so you start a new character and you get to the next page and so that like it will take you a number of attempts to get through it yeah i don't think that is style of play people will want nowadays no yeah people don't start an adventure die go right we'll start again with our player knowledge now no one does tomb of horrors by doing it and then going back and does it again and go back and do it again kind of thing no one does that anymore. no one uh, does roguelike D. Yeah. they want to get through it and make those decisions and then go what if rather than like oh i died oh i died or yeah, yeah all the way through absolutely and this is very much the adventure of you're going to learn to what not to do and what to do start again with a new load of slaves because you're not going to survive this it's really difficult unless the dice fall for you perfectly you're not going to survive this and the idea is you're isolated out in the middle of the desert so bringing in new characters you can do it, but there's only so many times you can go, oh, look, there's a stranger trying to change to a rock. You're the new yeah. character. You know what I mean? Like, the, the whole <laughs> desert is going to be, like, people waiting to be rescued kind of thing, mm. like Koroks in Tears of the Kingdom or whatever. But it's interesting, yeah, so the story itself, like you said, so, you know, what it comes out is that you get to finally get to an oasis of some sort, but you realise the water is poisoned, and that's yeah. because there's various sort of politics that are going on, so the people that sort of raided your caravan, essentially you got captured by one of the local sorcerer kings, and in a sort of retribution or sort of like a revenge against people being captured, the elven clan who it is have gone, we're going to poison every oasis. And you're like, okay, well, that's that sucks. But the only person that can cleanse it is the Thrycreen. They've been captured. And so eventually you'll have to be like, right, let's go save that Thrycreen. And then, yeah. and they, they don't, they don't like you at all. Nope. Uh, it, it gets across that nobody likes you and you're just doing your best. Um, so I think it's an interesting concept, this idea of like, what do you do when the water is poisoned? You go help out. It's like a, a bit about uh, dwarven children who are playing in the mudflats and they're getting sucked down by a, a horrible serpent thing. And you're yeah. like, these children should know better. <laughs> like, yes, like, what the hell? <laughs> so, yeah, I find that quite interesting. And then just going off that. So, yeah, the psionic stuff, go back into that. Yes. One thing that we sort of haven't mentioned is that everyone has this sort of low-level psionic power of some sort. There is definitely classes that people that you are psionic yeah. and you have these powers of. But everyone has the potential, including the monsters. And 
yeah, I don't. I so for, from your point of view, obviously getting that handbook and stuff. So what what does it add to that, if anything? Because it just feels like such a for me, it's such an abstract concept because we don't really have Psyonix currently in fifth edition that I'm aware of. I know there was some unearthed mm. arcana a long time ago about it, but it's not been included since then. Right. It felt you like you were adding um, a bit more science fiction element to it. Oh, because cool. Because what's the science fiction equivalent of mag- magicians? You never have wizards in science fiction games. You have sci- psychers. Mm. You know, that's the classic Warhammer thing. And instead of wizards, they're all psychers. And by everyone having a low level... Basically, imagine everyone having cantrips to start with. Mm-hmm. It adds that level of the fantastic to it, to a setting that's otherwise quite unremitting and grim. Mm-hmm. It allowed you to play a bit more with sort of stuff like, yes, I am a fighter, but I can do these little tricks. I can do these little illusions and stuff. And I think by doing that, it automatically embedded. Because magic had basically been stripped out the setting for players, mm-hmm. you needed another way of adding in the fantastic. So I think that's what Soundix was there for. Mm-hmm. And I really just think it adds those. It would be, yeah, it would be very grim. It would be very just gladiators walking around the desert. This is yes. it just gives them a bit more of the fantastic and the magical side. I realize I'm repeating myself here. No, no, no. But it's a good question. And it's from me. And by not class limiting it, Mm-hmm. Everyone felt useful. I think that's an important thing. Everyone feels yeah. like they can do something at some point, even if you're chained up. You can still do something. You know. Yeah, I mean? you can like, use your power to sort of get out of the chains in some yeah. way, etc. Yeah. Well, that's true because a lot of a previous D and D, and I think currently there's still that sort of limitation. So it's all suggested you should do this, you should do that. If you are an elf, you should do this. If you want to be yeah. a ranger, etc. Whereas, whereas it is is working towards like. You could be anything from anywhere, which yeah. some people, myself included, I would say, sometimes struggle with that because I'm like, I don't mind having preset things myself because that just gets it simpler because I don't have time to them min max and stuff. But it was interesting, obviously, back then, you could, if you were only, if you were playing a certain uh, race, you could only go up to certain levels in a class. For example, you could go all the yeah. way, etc. Which I thought was, I again, it obviously seems very alien to me by now. But obviously, I guess it, the system might have been so unbalanced or something like that if you went too far or something. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, Wizards, by the end of it, was ridiculous. It was, you were just, you were world killers. It was just like, all right, okay, cool, Jeff. Thanks for coming. I've got my sword. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've got thanks. my sword of plus two. Can I help? Can I help um, in some way? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't have another to disadvantage. I can't even do that. Um, oh. So, yeah, it's another way of injecting the fantastic, I think, into a, into a brutal setting. Mm-hmm. We should talk about, with the um, adventures, if you're going to run it, Mm. You've got a lot of things like there's a lot of admin. There's a lot of admin. Get yeah. ready. The chapter fourteen of the of the rule book is time and movement. Oh, good lord. And oh my god, effects of dehydration, dehydration madness. If you go too far, you have to make wisdom checks, otherwise you go absolutely mad and start killing people for water. Movement by night being different by movement by day. Mm. There's a lot. There's a lot. It, it's admin central, measuring out your waters by quartz and pints and all that stuff kind of Ugh, stuff it, no it, thanks. it's definitely a part of it you don't need anymore i think you drop it and you basically say and you've got enough water or you don't and if you don't you have a dehydration status and you're a disadvantage like if you're going to do 5e that's exactly how i do it you either, you yeah. either have water or you don't and then that's it yeah i did quite like they had this sort of uh athesian calendar this idea mm-hmm. of yeah, it's 11 and 7, so you have like a cycle at the beginning with all these different names of 11 and then a 7 afterwards, and it sort of goes through them. So like the first yeah. what first year is called Raoul's Fury and all that yeah. sort of thing. Uh, and I quite like that name. But then right at the end it says, by the way, if you, you could just always just use the Gregorian calendar. And I was like, no. <laughs> yeah. Don't use that. Don't use that. Come on. If you're going to be doing it, yeah, you want to be in the you know, the month of dragon slumber or, you know, the priest's vengeance. That's that's just great. That's yeah. a little touch there. I think... I think that what I really like about Dark Sun is it feels very alive. And yes. Seven, ironically, because everyone's dead. Um, but in complete <laughs> comparison to Al Qadim, Al Qadim mm. is the setting you kind of would want to go to. It sounds kind of cool. Dark Sun, no, stay away from Afas. It's just like, no, this is this is hell. This is absolutely dreadful. Yeah, like you said, it's that it is the darkest time in the sense of like these sorcerer kings are very lich like, essentially. Some of the, and it, yeah. there was a lot of in the primer talks about here are these example ones and all of them you're like i would not like to go to any of these places because they are all dreadful they're all paranoid uh they're using their templars to sort of against each other there's always sort of yeah. mystery stuff again i will say that these flip charts as well they're only 99 pages long oh. my god get it get it done in an afternoon easily you can read them through because i think sometimes you always see like a 300 page and you're like yeah. mm, oh now god. this is a very consumable book 
it's yeah. very you can see get the get pull out the map put it on the floor and then read the books and you'll have a great time it does a reason i think dark sun is beloved mm-hmm. i think in one way it's quite edge lordy um and i think edge lords always sort of like be like yeah but you haven't played dark sun fuck you blah, 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 blah. but it is an excellent i think i was uh I, I, the books there's novels around it mm-hmm. they're good books they're not the normal i mean other than the salvatore stuff they're not the usual trash they are good. There's computer games based around yes, it. Yes, yeah. There's four of them. Really good. Very difficult now, but uh, as all old games are. Mm-hmm. It's a setting that I do wish would come back. In a way, I don't want it to come back. I'd rather just someone else did it. But mm. that's not how licensing works. Um, no. Uh, this is a highly recommend pick up and read for me because I just mm. think you can use this in 5e quite easily, I think. Yeah. I would limit character progression because you're going to too quickly outstrip the world if you don't yeah. limit character progression. It'd be a fun plane to visit to get yes. thrown into this because good luck walking around in your plate mail oh, in no. half desert. You know, you're going to cook alive in there. Yeah, you're going to die literally in a half an hour most yeah. and then you've been yeah. taken off various greaves and all that sort of thing. Absolutely. And if you're a wizard, you're going to suddenly a load of Templars are going to be marching over the hill to get you. So you've got to keep that quiet. <laughs> It'd be a fun setting to visit in 5e. Yes. But also to be able to leave as well. I think, like, I can definitely see almost like a Planet of the Apes style of adventure where, like, you, for whatever reason, you you get shunted through a portal and you're in this the same place but different. And it's very, because it's obviously that it talks about this idea that the sands move or so suddenly a, a village can appear and you can go underneath and find these treasures and stuff. So again, it great for DMs if you like. I I like some of these villages. It talks about that of ruins, but uh, I want to make something different. Uh, easily, you can like oh, just underneath the ruins of this uh, city is a is another city, etc. Yeah. But I just like that. Yeah, you could go and like Waterdeep or Baldur's Gate, one of the big. Yeah, because Waterdeep has these big uh, statues that have been sort of sunk in the ground. Yes. So I can imagine you could do like the whole Statue of Liberty, and, like ah, oh, you blew it up, and you're like, yeah. no, no, that that's all the sorcerers' kings. It's uh, yes, yeah, like literally, yeah, you you could work out where the yawning portal was, and then next to it's this gigantic obsidian ziggurat that just dominates society. Yeah, that be you could do the Sword Coast post-apocalyptic kind of thing. And all these familiar things are are just ruins now, and completely. It's funny because it's that ancient Egyptian thing mm. where you're like, well, it's the desert, and everyone lives in these tiny huts, but then there's just these gigantic structures on the horizon that just mm. by imagination, you just be like, what the hell is that? Like, and yeah. Then, yeah. I, I, but also because another another setting we talked about was Under Mountain, another favorite setting yeah. of yours. Could you imagine Under Mountain? But with dark sun, so you, you yeah. go in and it's like this is not this is not better. This is yeah. in fact a lot worse. So yeah, it's a lot worse because the magics now, you, you would almost have it. The dark sun's magics that keep it running have been unleashed, and it's just now leaked. It would be growing like a root system, and mm-hmm. it just grows and develops and despoils around, defiles around it, kind of thing. You'd have a, 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 a almost not a sentient dungeon, but a dungeon that's magically cre- re- replicating itself by destroying everything around it. Oh, yeah, proper defile the magic on that front. That sounds really cool. <laughs> so this is the final sort of thing, because we didn't really mention yeah. it a little bit, because we sort of mentioned all the sort of different uh, races, so like the, obviously the half-dwarves, etc. Obviously, they have been changed to reflect, either been removed completely from uh-huh. this world or to re- sort of done to flex. And I think the most famous one that I knew about before coming into this was the halfling changes, in the sense of that they are now sort of xenophobic cannibal <laughs> jerk still jerks. i just and i just for me like I, there's just i think it's just something funny about it in the sense of like yeah. obviously not very pc now and i understand that yeah. but i just like the idea that these these creatures who are described in fifth edition as lovely or they yeah. like adventures but only so much as that, and just who completely go completely punk completely different yeah. hating each other hating yeah. other people very dalek like very sort of uh, beholder like this whole sort of xenophobic sort of like wow. paranoia thing and then also <laughs> eating people and i yeah. just i just thought oh i kind of love that as a storyline and again that's just maybe i don't know just something about that's it I, was like, I want to find out more about it you know they're the golem to yes. the hobbits of the halflings you know like like what what would you do if you were a hobbit you love eating and drinking and you're putting dark so there's nothing to eat or drink you'd go crazy and start eating everyone and everything yeah so, um, i think it's brilliant also i do think the artwork for them there's a brilliant bit of bra artwork where as you say fully punk 
is very much the kid from uh, Road Warrior who's got the boomerang yeah. that takes someone's hands off. It's definitely like, yeah, definitely <laughs> that. But yeah. Like, yeah, I think absolutely fantastic. I, I, and I like that. I'm a fan of the fact, uh, the Ewok philosophy. We mm. goes, oh, Ewoks are rubbish. We hate them. We hate Ewoks. The teddy bears. We know two things about Ewoks. They eat people. Yep. And they beat stormtroopers to death with rocks. Like, <laughs> he was terrifying and awful. And that's how a half thing should be to me. Just absolutely terrifying. You'd be like, no, I don't like this. I don't, I don't like this. Rub it like the most vicious Ewok you can. I like, yeah, I like that. Yeah, that comparison makes it a little bit better again. <laughs> yeah. But, and, and also as well, like we sort of mentioned in, in this passage, obviously Templars are the, the, the here as well. But also, um, I hadn't discovered this, like, the rogue sort of archetypes, obviously rogue's got a class here. Yeah. yeah the thief and bard underneath it. And bards, whilst obviously being uh, what we know and, and love this idea of giving out songs and, and stories, so they're also a master of poisons. And there's a yeah. massive chart about all these different poisons and stuff, which, again, bit too much for my little yeah. brain of uh, kittens, ribbons and bonnets. But um, I just suddenly was like, this, I, I love this idea of a very charming person who does lots of stories, but then is just poisoning people yeah. to get more water and stuff. And I just, yeah, I, for me, I split them into rogue and bard. Mm-hmm. And the idea that you can have this sort of element through, un- yeah, I just, I thought, oh yeah, you could just easily change these things around because of the whatever alignment in bunny ears, you know, you could be and stuff. So those are the things that just stood out to me as a, ah, oh, yeah. I'd like to play with that more. I think that bard class, almost you want it to be like a courtesan or something, would be the equivalent where yes, someone who can have their place but can also, you know, manipulate their way through their their Borgia, their uh, their Olivia in I Claudius kind of thing. Um, mm. And I think yeah, really cool. Just like there's just some. As I say, I I honestly think this is just a brilliant source book to buy. Uh, mm-hmm. The PDFs are like a. Not even a tenner, I don't think, on Drive to RPG. It's much like, less than that, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just get it as a source book. Don't use the rules, but there's yeah. so much you could bring in because it moves D&D away from the Tolkien elements Yes, to more sort of 80s stuff, which, you know, you might not like. You know, it's not yeah. it's for everyone, and that's no judgment on anyone. But no. if you want another type of fantasy, get this. Read some Jack Man's books and sort of go, okay, this is this is how it could be. Also, the artwork on the Defiler, page 27, is so good. So like, good. Yeah, it's like proper. Even if you just have it for art, even if you my character, I'm playing in a Salt Marsh game at the moment. All I use is brother art for my character. <laughs> He's a half-orc who has seen himself through visions on the plains of Athas. Uh, oh. Like, even I'm playing Blackmore, and I'm like, no, it's damn a dark some character there, so. Oh, I, I love uh, that. Yeah. yeah. Like, he, he keeps having... Uh, because for me, the, the what set D and D apart from other universes is the planes element mm-hmm. to it, which I know nowadays everyone fucking does with Doctor Strange, whatever. Um, but that <laughs> idea of I have a character who exists on every plane, mm. and he can see himself on every plane at different times, kind of thing. Um, and he might be a different race, even it might be oh sorry uh, heritage. He might be a different heritage. He might be a different class. But that person exists on every plane. It's like mm. the Eternal Champion style, the and he in the Soul Marsh game can see the one that's pushing through the most is the element of him on Athas, the the the, the, the avatar of him on Athas, which is as a gladiator slave, basically. Mm. Uh, so he's having these visions of being crucified upside down in front of an obsidian pyramid. While he's you know in black in, in Salt Marsh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're gonna say Blackpool? I was like, that's the which hell is worse. <laughs> well, at least it's the chips. But yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's funny. You said obviously, like Marvel has pretty much gone uh, multiverse, yoink. Oh. Uh, but also, very recently, as of two days or three days of this recording, across the Spider Verse come out. I saw that yesterday, and this idea of multiple different uh, Spider Mans. Spider Mans. Uh, yeah. Spider Mans. Um, I, I, I can highly recommend checking that out as well because, like, it, it, what exactly what you're saying these obviously different kinds of Spider Man from different places and different Earths and stuff like that really yeah. speaks into that. So I love that idea that your character can see or has these visions and stuff. That's yeah. what is that? What's going on that this 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 is this doesn't bode well for the multiverse or the cosmos that you can no. see if you're it, going it, Spider-Man pointing to other people like, huh? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> but you know that, that it's, it's the fantastic you want because I think the worst in D is when you have medieval Europe with magic stuck on it. That's boring. Yeah. It's, and Dark Sun's so far from that. This is a world where the Physics, and I use that to cover all the sort of science yes. or whatever of D and D makes more sense. I agree because you can't just do these things. That you think, well, that 
the one for me is in D and D you can create in standard D you can create to the war, right? And they like like break, yeah, uh, food, yeah, uh, purify, yeah, yeah, something like something basic, yeah. Well, basically, it moves D and D into a post scarcity economy immediately, and it's like, well, this doesn't work now. Why, why have we got gold pieces when you have got magicians who are just like have that, have that. Have, have this, that, have this, have yeah. this. And he's like, well, this doesn't make any sense anymore. Uh, whereas I think Dark Sun is a world that makes sense in that it's dreadful and magic's dreadful and everyone's dreadful and it turns out water can't just be created. So there is the thing. Yeah. So I just give it a go. Please just give it a go. Yeah. The other, the other thing I'd recommend is watching Spartacus Blood and Sand. Uh, obviously 18 plus it's very very violent very bloody and homoerotic and erotic and everything it's brilliant watch that it's fantastic oh, i'll check it out i'll put it on my you never watch blood in the sand hey look at me <laughs> weirdly i'm not into conan or any of these sort of these big things i i used to be yeah. a medieval europe person and now i'm this is me testing other things i try out yeah, like, okay. it sounds great it's amazing uh, it's where, and there is supernatural elements in it the gods and stuff so yeah like, how do you feel about seeing a man have his face cut off in close-up detail oh if it's for a story then sure if it, yeah, if it moves the story forward it's for plot yeah it's cool plot, for plot reasons you should plot no longer reasons. have a face <laughs> yeah the final thing i want to say before we yes. sort of wrap up is that Obviously, again, I know it's legacy content. A lot of the uh, pronoun uses in it is like he, he, yes. he. Right? I would see that. The bard, the bard, it, he is a carry. He's like, all right, cheers, thanks. Yeah, yeah. And it's like all of a sudden, thing. Well, I say that there is a there is a small line later on in, uh, in the um, the wondrous journal goes. Uh, there is no distinction made between the positions which men and women can hold. For both sexes are seem to be equally capable of the treachery required to attain oh. a hold power, which I thought was a great line actually. I was yeah. like, it doesn't, I don't care what gender you identify as, because you're still corrupt. Yeah, you're still awful. It doesn't matter. It turns out people are dicks, and that's that people yeah. also want. Yes. Which no, I thought was great. I think, yes, there are problematic elements. I think, I think if I ran it now, I wouldn't try and fix it. And I'm again using bunny ears here. Yes, yeah. If you take the slavery out, yeah. it's a terrible topic, but it would be like running an ancient Rome game and taking the slavery out. And you're like, well, this is, I think this is a, as I said at the very beginning, it's it a is. setting where you get buy in. It's the, it's, yeah. It's like playing cult instead of Call of Cthulhu. You yeah. get your players, you get them aware, you say, well, we don't have to play this setting. <laughs> this is the no. Thing to do. But it is a bad setting. It's a problematic yeah. setting by its very nature because that's what would happen with humans or if we went into a post apocalyptic society, it would be appalling. And I think it's worth delving into for a bit for a lot yeah. of people. Some yeah. people might just be like, yes, this is exactly the sort of sort I want to play. I would recommend everyone gives it a go. I just think be aware. I think that's it. I think it's the classic thing of like uh, a Disney film now, put a finger at the front saying, be aware this yes. is legacy content. Exactly, yeah. Table uh, Session zero, all the safety tools. And yeah. yeah, exactly that whole explanation of let's explore this and let's talk about it. And I think yeah. I, I, I would actually value more RPG games like where we could do that. Again, with everyone's, like you said, everyone's buying a yeah. consent and stuff like that. Because otherwise, like, it's very easy for us just to be in our own little echo chambers and not Ooh. consider these things and not thinking yeah. it's a problem and stuff. And only, only years later you go... Hmm, probably mm-hmm. probably should have said something at the time. So yeah, I completely yeah. agree. I think it's from what I've gathered from it, there's stuff in it I really, really love and I'd love yeah. to explore it. I kind of love this idea, like you said, that sort of making it a different plane, making it as a a future that maybe will always happen or you know, how, wow. what, you know, I love that idea. And then yeah, those other elements, I don't know how I would fix them if I could fix them. And I, that's well, why I, I do wonder if it will ever reappear as a setting uh, for publication. There's obviously a wonderful uh, fr- third person content, obviously DM skill, people will always make stuff. I think they're still making stuff here for it. But I think, you know, it's one of those things where the wizards, let's just say they've had a bit of a rough, rough couple of months. Yeah. You know, Not uh, it. OGL, Pinkertons, yeah. you know, maybe they don't need this yeah. currently. So. I missed the Pinkerton stuff and then someone told me about it. I was like, oh my God. I think they'll leave this one for some time, but you don't have to. As a player, you don't have to. It turns out it doesn't need to have Matt Mercer the, um, approved stuff on the front. You know, it's a stamp 5e, yay, Chris Corolla only. Could you imagine Matt Mercer or Brendan Lee Mulligan doing Halflings, the ca- cannibalistic half? I think actually that Brendan has done something similar. I to know that. who Brendan is now. I didn't know who this man was. And then there I started you go. watching Game Changer, and there um, you go. that's a lot of people I won't want to spend time with. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, thank you so much, Rob, for spending an early morning. I appreciate you were so busy, like, celebrating your team's win <laughs> yesterday. I did a lot of work for it. You did a lot of work for it, Not you know. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much. Obviously, I appreciate, you know, social media and stuff. It's not necessarily a thing you do anymore, but if, and you've done already a lot of recommendations for stuff. But if oh. there's something you would like to specifically recommend, I'll give you that space now. Yeah. If there's, I know you've already done lots of recommendations, but if anything that's maybe not related to Dark Sun or anything that you're just enjoying yeah. right now. Let me throw two free recommendations at you uh, that are not at all related to Dark Sun. Uh, two TV programs. One is Poker Face with natasha leon lyon uh which is great yes colombo she, tw- she's great she's brilliant. great yeah, it's like 21st century colombo absolutely brilliant the other is the bbc series if you watch it if you are in the uk because i know it's you can't watch it outside the uk once upon a time in northern ireland which is a five-part absolutely harrowing documentary about the troubles uh excellent really good really covered it's got it's got interviews with IRA members, UDA members, paramilitaries, the police, soldiers, civilians. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, Being a good place when you watch it. Uh, <laughs> it is not good. Uh, it is good, but it's not good. Yes. And the other thing is the book series um, about the women. It's called, it starts with, it's not really got a name as a trilogy, but it starts with a book called The Silence of the Girls. Mm-hmm. It's by Pat Barker, who wrote the Regeneration Trilogy. Um, which is about the First World War. But this is called Clowns of the Girls, and it's a retelling of the Iliad and the Siege of Troy from the perspective of the women. Oh, I will say, the cover for it looks gorgeous. Yes. Yeah. Oh, two my word. The it is great. Absolute trigger warning. It is, by its very nature, full of slavery and sexual violence and things like that because it is it's not graphic at all, but it is... It, it's about what happens to the women when 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 great achilles takes the city of troy what does that mean mm-hmm. you know, uh, he doesn't but anyway but uh, well, what does that mean and you know what what would the reality be like living as that it's really well really compelling but yes oh, well, again cool. another harrowing one i do read some nice stuff occasionally occasionally but i think to be fair to you like anything like greek mythology north mythology women yeah. don't tend to end up well and it's, exactly. so it's yeah um, so that's always a big like okay cool but i will say that i mean first of all i know i know you shouldn't judge a book by co- its cover but yeah the cover looks great, great. and yeah. i yeah i i always i love having different points of view of same historical events because it's always it's something different so yeah that is going straight on the list thank you so yeah, much for that I highly recommend that and that's it yes yeah, I'm on, on social media so if you want to talk to me you have to already be my friend <laughs> <laughs> jokes on you I don't have any friends jokes on me I've had to email you and Instagram you I know, right? <laughs> and then even then you're like I'm not using Instagram anymore I'm I'm like, yeah, that makes yep. sense oh well thank you so much Rob it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you right yes same and we'll do another one soon some plans um, I need to apologise to your listeners for my voice um, to date this uh, Manchester City won the Champions League last night so I can shout <laughs> a lot. Uh, so if I'm a little bit rumbly that's why um, I just think but, you're just coming across the beautiful desert like you're doing the you know doing like welcome to yeah like Omar <laughs> Sharif or something in, uh, in Lawrence Arabia um, 